Uh, I'm going to talk about our work. Um, we w uh, Rainbow Health Ontario uh, really um, is a knowledge transfer and exchange uh, program, and we work to bring knowledge, information, and so on uh, on lesbian, gay, bi, and trans people. But today, um, I'm going to look at it entirely through the lens of transgender population. Trans, we use the word trans population. Um, but you'll see all the different kinds of things that we do. So I'm going to give you a little bit of background about Rainbow Health Ontario. Um, and then I'm going to break down the way that we use, we're primarily talking here about our use of website. We don't do a great deal of um, direct service or interactive work uh, using the internet. We, we do training that's live. Um, and we do meetings that are live and so on. Uh, so I'm talking primarily about the way that we've used the website and social media and things like that to connect with different populations. So first I'm going to talk about how we correct, connect directly with the trans community. Then I'm going to talk a bit about our work with service providers because there's such a, a, a very large um, lack of knowledge among service providers. Uh, in the area of trans health. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about our work with researchers and policy makers. And then if we have some time, we can talk. If anybody wants, if anybody has any problems with translation, just, you know, maybe people can help out here. All, all good so far? Yeah? So this is our mission and vision. It's a, it is a province-wide program designed to improve access to services and to promote the health of Ontario's lesbian, gay, bi, and trans populations. And our vision is a province where all LGBT people are healthy, valued members of diverse communities and supported by equitable services and public policy. And is, I think the key, one of the keys there is to recognize that we are not a monolithic community, that even within the different grouping of uh, sexual orientation and gender identity, there are multiple other communities within that. I think we all know that, but we try very hard to remember that we are also talking about uh, ethno-racial difference and rural and urban and people who live in the north and so on, and that life can be very different for all of those reasons. Um, just so you understand, our, our, we are classified really as a knowledge transfer and exchange program, and we're funded through the Research Institute of the Mi Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care in Ontario. So this is not a direct government agency, but the money is transferred to Sherbin Health Centre, which has a very large LGBT health program, does direct service, clinical programs, community programs, and then we are within that structure of, of Sherbin Health Centre. And I think it's the only organization like this where the government has funded um, a program to, to deliver um, province-wide, um, not direct service, but really um, knowledge transfer and exchange services. Um, I don't know, would there be anybody else who would say there's something like that in their province? Not at the moment. So our work is not so much direct service as in delivering clinical services, but working with community members to provide information, knowledge, and to build awareness and understanding. With A, a lot of our work is actually fo focused on service <coughs> providers. Uh, both in health and social services, because we have a very broad understanding of health. We work with researchers and policymakers. So in many ways, what we're trying to do is to reach out to many disparate parts of the system and bring them together. Because um, our sense is that in Ontario, the, the work has been very fragmented. It's been very grassroots often. Um, and, but it's been very difficult for people to really have any place to see uh, the whole easily. So I'm hoping I can give you a, a slight illustration of that 
But as I said again, I'm only going to give examples around trans health today, even though we do cover every, every group. So this is uh, our structure. We ha we're uh, about four and a half years old. So we developed our structure to be this. It, we didn't change from something else. We didn't change from a service agency into having these web-based materials. We actually designed this website to um, meet these needs, these goals. Um, so we have myself as director, and then we have, um, at the moment, five coordinators, uh, one person specifically to do communications work, one person whose goal is to work primarily with research, the researchers and to take a lead on policy. We have a person who coordinates our education and training activities. We have a person who's a francophone service coordinator, and I, I did try to bring him here today to work with me. Unfortunately, he's, uh, he's away, in, he's uh, out of the country this week. So that was unfortunate, but I tried. Um, and he is there really to provide any kind of service that we provide in French and to provide, um, you know, uh, the opportunity for Franco-Ontarians to speak directly to someone en français. Mm -hmm. Matt Francina. Yeah, yeah. And then lastly, the, we have someone who is on a two-year project, which is ending in March. Uh, his name is Jordan Zaitso, and he, he runs our Trans Health Connection project which is a special project to provide in-depth training on trans health. We are about to go into a new funding cycle now. Um, I'm just doing a proposal now where we hope to, con to have an, a further three years of funding starting in April. And, if, and I'm trying to write in that Trans Health Connection project because we've been doing it quite successfully for um, nearly two years, but there's a lot of work really to, to create an in-depth service for trans people in a whole pro big province like Ontario. So I'm trying to roll that, that project into the, the bigger um, proposal. And then at the bottom, you see we have outreach workers. Um, in Ontario, the structure of healthcare is such that we have the local health integration networks, which are like regional health planning and funding bodies. There are 14 of them. So that had just been put into place by the government when we developed Rainbow Health Ontario. So we decided to ask for 14 outreach workers. They're not full time. <laughs> they are 10 hours a month. So a tiny little bit. But it means someone probably has another job or is a student or in some cases they're retired. But it's somebody who lives in the community. In each, we make sure that they live in all of those 14 areas. It's somebody who is out and comfortable as a lesbian, gay, bi, trans person, who's well networked, and who can be like our eyes and ears on the ground. So they do do a few events. They know who the key people are in their region. They can link us to things, and 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 link. The, other people to us. So in many ways, they provide a kind of connecting function and, and spreading what we do out to all of the, the province. So that's how that works. So our services, our, our KTE strategies, if you like, uh, are along these lines. Communications, community outreach, research and policy, education and training. Didn't know that was going to do that. Um, and then this is just a model to show the how we try to integrate all these different parts together and how how we see the the need to to work on multiple fronts to create capacity and uh, and 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 quality services for LGBT people. So I'm going to just talk a little now about the trans health. So for trans community members, um, 
they might primarily use our website. And I'm going to show you how they might do a few things. So they might want to find useful information about transition. They might want to find a place where they could go to get health, health care. And particularly, it's important for trans people to find a place that actually will prescribe hormones, that will monitor them, will, will offer social support. So we're really talking about trans-specific health care. Uh, they may want to participate in research studies. We, 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 we post research studies for people to be involved in. They may want to look for trans-friendly events in their region. And they may want to connect with us via Facebook and Twitter. So what I've done is I've made some screen captures of the website. So you can see if we were really going into the website, we could, where we could go. So there's the website. That's the, the main page. It is in French as well. But of course, there's not as much in French because we don't have as many things to put on it. Uh, but, but I will show you some French things as we go. Um, so the person might start by opening the website and then noticing that down here, the latest resources says that there is trans Ontarian sex designation on federal and provincial identity documents. So that's been a change now. Uh, so that's a report that is trying to influence the, uh, the new bill in uh, federal parliament that's trying to change uh, human rights for trans people. So this is a report that was, co was commissioned by some of the people working on that bill. So we're going to go there, and there it is. We can go in and find the report in our resource database. And if we open it up, we would see that it is done by TransPulse. TransPulse is a very big study that has been going on in Ontario um, Rainbow Health Ontario, I myself have been involved with it for eight years. Um, and it's got, it's got so much data that we are continually pulling new, new parts out and analyzing them. And uh, you may know Greta Bauer and Rob Travers. Rob Travers is not related to me, although we sometimes joke that we're sisters. Um, <laughs> and uh, so we're constantly able to pull really valuable data from this report from this uh, study. So Greta just pulled this together just in November to contribute to that discussion um, at the national level. Then we might want to go, um, and here's a French uh, resource. So we're back in the resource database, and there's a guide for LGBT people on um, assisted reproduction. That's what that says for the English people. And that's in both languages. Uh, that work was done actually with another program at Sherman Health Center called the Parenting Network. And uh, they worked with the Human Reproduction um, Agency, which is now finished, but managed to produce this guidebook. And then we might want to find, I, this is still being a trans community member, maybe we want to find somewhere where we can get health care. There are not lots and lots, but here's an example where East Mississauga Community Health Center is now developing services. And you can see in the text down here that they are uh, offering services for transgender, transsexual, intersex, etc. And they're, they're really coming along very well. So maybe we want to see if we can go there if we live in that part of the province. And then we have a section on the, on the, on the um, website where we, we post research studies, usually research studies that where they're taking place in Ontario. And we have some criteria for the studies we put up. It would have to be done by a, um, a, a researcher with uh, the appropriate credentials. Um, it's not like every, everybody who dreams something up. Uh, but we, we do post research so that you can, we, so that we can promote people's research and so that the community be, can become engaged with research because we believe that we, we want to stimulate good research and we, and we find that LGBT people are quite motivated often to participate in research because they want people to know 
what their issues are. So here are two. The top one is the Home Care Access Project, uh, studying home care for LGBT. And the second one is understanding factors involved in self-injury. Uh, and both are uh, inclusive of trans people. So we might want to be involved in those. And then maybe we want to look in events and see what can we do. Um, this is an interesting event where the Human Rights Commission in Ontario has been going out around the province and discussing mental health issues. Um, and they come to us uh, and say, can you help us to promote this with your populations? We've done quite a lot of work with the Human Rights Commission with briefs and with focus groups and here just promoting access to an event and to make sure that it's inclusive of LGBT people. So this one is in Windsor, but they're going to other parts of the province as well. And then here are some other events to show you some other places that are holding events. Um, the Rainbow Pool Night, which is in Perth, Ontario. That's quite rural. Um, something in Ontario, celebrating gender diversity. And then another um, training event uh, that, we, that we did, which is in Kenora. Kenora is in the very, very most western corner of the province, north, north, north. This is the first time we went to Kenora ever um, to do a full day of training. It, it took a long time. It took two years eventually to have conversations and to develop and to get that invitation. But we were very happy finally to be able to go. So the, then we have uh, Facebook. And um, at the moment, we have 1,016 followers in Facebook. And um, we, we post things constantly that are of interest to people. Often. Um, topical things, um, subjects of interest, maybe to advertise something new. Um, we have a newsletter, so we'll put that on it as well. So we have multiple ways for people to connect with information. Um, so you can see that uh, the, little, the, the latest one is that the Ministry of Health in Ontario is allowing people to change the gender marker on their health card. This is very big. Um, and it was a complete surprise to us. It's something that we had been asking for, um, and we had been told by people in government that that was very unlikely to happen, and then all of a sudden it seems to have happened, that you can change the gender marker without having surgery. So, the interesting news. That got a lot of attention. So now I'm going to talk a little about health and social service providers and how they are able to make use of this website. Um, so, and I'm going to make a slight detour um, to, tr to discuss the Trans Health Connection Program a little bit more uh, because I was asked to spend a little more time just saying what that does. So I'll go fairly quickly through that. We're going to talk about how they might find resources and materials to make their services more welcoming. So back to the home page again. This time we're going to go into that button on the right called Trans Health Connection. That's the special project that we've had for two years on trans health. And the goal is to increase the capacity of the primary health care system. So we're really locating this in primary health care, uh, which is now in accordance with um, international standards. The World Professional Association of Transgender Health recommends that for most people, um, trans health care, transition services can be provided within the context of primary health care. And uh, this project, again, was funded by the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care. And the goal is to fill gaps in health care by offering comprehensive clinical training and support to healthcare teams, agencies, and individual providers. We primarily have tried to focus on teams. So these are the components. The training, which is delivered by physicians, nurses, social workers, and mental health counselors. We have a mentorship uh, aspect to it. So mentorship and consultation with the, with the people receiving the training. 
um, through teleconferencing. So again, this is using a technology not very sophisticated. It's not web-based technology. We're just using a telephone line and a call-in service. Uh, but it seems to be working quite well. And then access to evidence-based protocols, resources, and uh, a little area on the website that we, where we're creating a special toolkit for uh, providers. And then we're trying to start to build a community of practice in this area by starting to connect people together through the phone calls, through the training, and when we can, we're trying to build them, bring them together in person. So we were able to, as part of this project, bring people together for a full day of Learning Institute at the Rainbow Health Ontario Conference. So this is where we started. We tried to start as far as we could across the province. So uh, Ottawa, Thunder Bay, St. Catharines, which is the, the, the middle one, and then right out on the end is Windsor. And these were teams who had already indicated some um, skills in working with <coughs> lesbian, gay, and bi people, and were ready to move on to do more in the, in the, in the field of trans care. And of course, strategically located as far from Toronto as we could get. Um, and these are four full days of training. They don't have to be done four days in a row. Often people will do two days and then two days, but it is a very large commitment. So this is module one, where we introduce people, as always, to the difference between gender identity and sexual orientation. I, I don't think we ever skip that step. It's always where we have to start because people think they understand, but they don't. Language, terminology, appropriate pronouns, that sort of thing. We talk about history uh, because uh, trans people have had such an unfortunate history often with service providers and we feel they need to understand where people are coming from. Um, we talk about the general health care needs and barriers to care and then in how to provide welcoming, respectful services. So that's a very introductory day. The model that we've used for this is to, for all of this training, is to start with a host site that might provide some of the components, but to ask that host site to invite other people from their area. So in many of the areas when we went and did a training like this, we would have 60 or 70 people. Even in Thunder Bay, I think we had more than 50, which, which I found amazing that there would be 50 people who would come for a whole day in Thunder Bay. And, and the idea is to, to have some depth in one host site, but also to create um, virtual teams, you know, that are broader than just one place. Because trans care, it's not that it's so difficult, but people need different kinds of support. So you often find that there's a very good mental health counselor here, and there's a doctor or a nurse here. You might need an endocrinologist sometimes. You may need a psychiatrist sometimes. Um, and, and so on. So it's good to have um, people beginning to create their own community of practice in a region. This is the second module, um, primary health care. Uh, we get really into now um, doing the assessment, the hormone treatment, and we use the protocols from Sherbin Health Center, um, and then the monitoring and health promotion that you should do and supports and referrals. And for here, we actually take a physician and a nurse out to do this training because we find that providers really like to hear from a provider. Even though we have people with great expertise who can talk about all this stuff, if a doctor is, t is telling other doctors, the chances are much higher that they might um, take this up. And it is an area where people have to overcome a lot of um, resistance and fear for many reasons, partly because they've believed for a long time that this is too specialized for primary care, partly because the idea of giving someone hormones and seeing them transform in front of them I think is, is scary if you're not very familiar with it. Um, they often think that it's a lot more com <coughs> complex and dangerous than it is. So we have to spend a lot of time building confidence, building skills, um, and giving them the feeling that they will continue to get support. This is the third module. We talk about 
pre pre preparing people for surgery and what, how to work with them after they've had surgery. People frequently need some uh, small um, post-operative care. Um, and how to work with more complex clients, maybe people who have medical contraindications, medical problems, maybe they can't take hormones, maybe they have to be adjusted, and so on. Or people with more complex mental health problems. And then there is a module which is primarily for social workers, mental health counselors, and so on, um, where we, we train them on how to provide supportive counseling, not gatekeeping, supportive counseling, and how to, do, how to offer a group that we have developed called Gender Journeys. And now I think there are about five different Gender Journeys groups happening across the province. It's a very successful um, educational support group for trans people to prepare for transition or in the early stages. Um, the mentorship is an opportunity, as I said, to call in once a week. We have it for an hour at lunchtime on a Wednesday. And um, Jordan, our coordinator, coordinates it. But we usually have a nurse, a physician from Sherbin Health Center who comes upstairs to sit in the room and answer questions. And people are also helping each other out. Sometimes we have um, a guest on the, on the call, so a guest who does a little 20-minute talk and then they and then they discuss. Um, it's, we thought that it would be mostly for physicians and nurses, but in fact, the most, uh, um, I guess the most keen are the counselors and mental health workers. Uh, we have some people who are on the call every week, some people who come just once in a while, some people who just have a certain question. So um, now we're back into the website again. This is the part of the website that's um, if you took that button, you would see it's like a little special area within the website. So you would see the welcoming page, the, the information on the mentorship program, and then the special little database. These are all in the big database as well, but just to have a little area where it's easy to find things. So here you can see some of the resources that um, providers might use. This is not locked to the public, so that we don't have a professional area and a public area. It's all open. Often we find the public knows a great deal more than the professionals anyway, so it makes no sense to do it that way. And then these are the training dates that are coming up in Ontario for, so a person could see, you know, when are we going to be out training and where, or they can request training. This is um, the last, con the the last conference that we had in Ottawa, uh, the next one will be in Toronto, as you see, in February, early February 2014, if you want to just keep a note. We would love to see you all there. We want very much to have people from across all of Canada, really. And um, we're expecting at least 350 people at that conference. Um, but in this conference, we were able to bring together many of the people that we had trained. We had gone out and done the four uh, sites, and we brought those people together to actually have a full day to discuss their experiences and how, how they had adapted our models to the north, to Windsor, to the Ottawa area. Ottawa has done incredible work now where they have um, set up committees, they have their own advisory groups, they have all kinds of things. It has really taken off. Um, in the north, they they're, are um, having difficulties getting physicians to prescribe and start hormones, but the nurse practitioners are very keen. So they are linking um, through uh, something called Ontario Telemedicine Network, which is a, um, a link, uh, an audio video link, um, which is secure. And they are linking to a physician who's practicing in the south, but he's doing an assessment on the, on, on the uh, video, by video link, with the patient. And then st he will write the prescription for the hormones so they don't have to travel anywhere. So that's a very interesting use of internet te technology to solve a problem. And then the nurse practitioners up in Thunder Bay are very actively carrying on the, the, um, the care. Um, 
if the uh, providers want to make their, their center welcoming for uh, trans people, they may want to go into our store. We have an online store, and I've brought a few things for you to look at, um, where you could order uh, pamphlets or uh, posters specific to any of these populations. And we've mostly had to create these because they don't exist. And there's the manual for the Gender Journeys group that I talked about. You can order a manual that tells you how to run it. So this is very quick. I know I'm out of time. Um, the researchers and policy makers, we have created a researcher network to exchange ideas and participate in skill building events. And we wanted to make researchers more visible as we want to make all LGBT people more visible. We also wanted to make our researchers more visible to everybody. So we've created um, an area where they can submit a profile and they can get a profile on the website and talk a little about their work. Um, we bring the researchers into Toronto about once a, uh, a year. We, we try to put some funds into bringing them in and working with them. Um, we've worked on um, creating better access and relationships with funders. We've talked about um, uh, methods. We had a methods institute at the last conference. We've talked about, and we're going to do some more work, I think, on um, knowledge translation and exchange strategies the next time. The researchers and also policymakers can find reports and fact sheets. We've started now to do synthesis documents called fact sheets on topics where it's quite difficult to get synthesized information and where often it would take an awfully long time or a lot of expertise to comb through all of the literature. So here's one of our researchers. This is Rob Travers, who has been working on the TransPulse study. And he has his profile. There are another 32, I think, who have profiles, all Ontario researchers. They're all at different universities. They're, and many have never met each other before they met each other in our events. So we, we are starting to create a bit of a community of researchers. This is one of the fact sheets. So this is a topic that's now very, very um, current and, and popular. And this is on gender independent children, sometimes called gender variant children. Um, people are really, really asking for more information in this area. So we have been doing a project working with uh, a number of different uh, groups to create a kind of advisory committee around this and to try to look at what needs to happen. But we've also created this fact sheet, which is available on the website. Everything can be downloaded directly from the website. And there's another fact sheet. This one is on reproductive options for trans people. So again, you could know what would, be, what would you need to give, what, how could you advise a trans person if you were working with one about things like um, sperm banking or freezing eggs or maintaining fertility. So these are very you know, um, important um, topics for trans people. Who are, who are going to transition. The fact sheets are not, um, in, we, we, we don't usually make big print runs of them, in part because as the information changes, we want to be able to update them. So you can download it and print it, but we don't make big runs. We are starting to use other interactive web-based technologies. So I mentioned the Ontario Telemedicine Network, which um, is, exists in most, he most health centers and hospitals, but it's, um, it's more for a one-to-one -one kind of uh, interaction and it's not very good for group-type conferences. Uh, we're looking at webinars, we're looking at web conferencing, and one of the, the things that I'm very uh, interested to find out from the rest of you, the colleagues here today, is how you're using other kinds of more interactive technologies because we want to see how could we adapt them for the kind of work that we're doing. So I'll be very interested. Thank you. That's